A Change of Treatment by W. W. Jacobs from Many Cargoes. Yes, I've sailed under some cute skippers in my time, said the night watchman. Them that go down in big ships see the wonders of the deep, you know, he added with a sudden chuckle. But the one I'm going to tell you about ought never to have been trusted out without his ma. A good many of my skippers had fads, but this one was the worst I ever sailed under. It's some years ago now. I'd shipped on his bark, the John Elliot, as slow-going an old tub as ever I was aboard of, when I wasn't in quite a fit and proper state to know what I was doing, and I hadn't been in her two days afore I found out his obby through overhearing a few remarks made by the second mate, who came up from the dinner in a hurry to make em. I don't mind saws and knives hung round the cabin, he says to the fust mate, but when a chap has a human and alongside his plate studying it while folks is at their food, it's more than a Christian man can stand. That's nothing, says the fust mate, who had sailed with the bark afore. He's half crazy on doctrine. We nearly had a mutiny aboard once, owing to his wanting to hold a post-mortem on a man what fell from the masthead wanted to see what the poor feller died of i call it unwholesome says the second mate very savage he offered me a pill at breakfast the size of a small marble quite put me off my feet it did of course the skipper's fad soon got known for but i didn't think much about it till one day i seed old daniel dennis sitting on a locker reading every now and then he'd shut the book and look up closing his eyes and moving his lips like a hen drinking and then look down at the book again why dan i says what's up you ain't learning lessons at your time of life yes i am says dan very soft you might hear me say it it's this one about heart disease. He hands over the book, which was stuck full of all kinds of diseases, and winks at me hard. Picked it up on a bookstall, he says. Then he shut his eyes and said his piece wonderful. It may be quite queer to listen to him. That's how I feel, says he, when he finished. Just strength enough to get to bed. Lend a hand, Bill, and go and fetch the doctor. Then I see his little game. But I wasn't going to run any risks, so I just mentioned, permiscuous like, to the cook, as old Dan seemed rather queer, and went back and tried to borrow the book, being always fond of reading. Old Dan pretended he was too ill to hear what I was saying, and afore I could take it away from him, the skipper comes hurrying down with a bag in his hand. "'What's the matter, my man?' says he. "'What's the matter?' I'm all right, sir, says old Dan, except that I've been swooning away a little. Tell me exactly how you feel, says the skipper, feeling his pulse. Then old Dan set his piece over to him, and the skipper shook his head and looked very solemn. How long have you been like this, he says. Four or five years, sir, says Dan. It ain't nothing serious, sir, is it? You lie quite still says the skipper, putting a little trumpet thing to his chest, and then listening. Um, there's serious mischief here, I'm afraid. The prognotis is very bad. Prog what, sir? says Dan, staring. Prognotis, says the skipper. At least I think that's the word he said. You keep perfectly still, and I'll go and mix you up a draft, and tell the cook to get some strong beef tea on. Well, the skipper had no sooner gone than Cornish Harry, a great big lumbering chap of six feet, too, goes up to old Dan, and he says, Give me that book. Go away, says Dan. Don't come worrying here. You are the skipper. Say how bad my prognotice was. You lend me the book, says Harry, 
catchin' hold of him, or else I'll bang you first, and split to the skipper arterward. I believe I'm a bit consumptive. Anyway, I'm going to see. He dragged the book away from the old man and began to study. There was so many complaints in it he was almost tempted to have something else instead of consumption, but he decided on that at last, and he got a cough what worried the foxle all night long. And the next day, when the skipper came down to see Dan, he could hardly hear hisself speak. That's a nasty cough you got, my man, says he, looking at Harry. Oh, it's nothing, sir, says Harry, careless like. I've had it for months now, off and on. I think it's perspiring so of a night, does it? What, says the skipper, do you perspire of a night? Dreadful, says Harry. You could wring the clothes out. I suppose it's healthy for me, ain't it, sir? Undo your shirt, says the skipper, going over to him and sticking the trumpet again him. Now take a deep breath. Don't cough. I can't help it, sir, says Harry. It will come. Seems to tear me to pieces. You get to bed at once, says the skipper, taking away the trumpet and shaking his head. It's a fortunate thing for you, my lad, you're in skilled hands. With care, I believe I can pull you round. How does that medicine suit you, Dan? Beautiful, sir, says Dan. It's wonderful soothing. I slept like a newborn babe arter it. I'll send you to get some more, says the skipper. You're not to get up, mind, either of you. All right, sir, says the two in very faint voices, and the skipper went away arter telling us to be careful not to make a noise. We all thought it a fine joke at first, but the airs them two chaps give themselves was something sickening. Being in bed all day, they was naturally wakeful of a night, and they used to call across the forecastle inquiring arter each other's healths and waking us other chaps up and they'd swap beef tea and jellies with each other and dan a try and coax a little port wine out a harry which he had to make blood with but harry ud say he hadn't made enough that day and he'd drink to the better health of old dan's prognotis and smack his lips until it drove us a most crazy to ear him after these chaps had been ill two days, the other fellers began to put their heads together, being maddened by the smell o' beef tea and the like, and said they was going to be ill too, and both the invalids got into a fearful state of excitement. "'You'll only spoil it for all of us,' says Harry, "'and you don't know what to have without the book. "'It's all very well doing your work as well as your own,' says one of the men it's our turn now it's time you two got well well says harry well why you silly ignorant chaps we shan't never get well people with our complaints never do you ought to know that well i shall split says one of them you do says harry you do and i'll put a ed on you that all the port wine and jellies in the world wouldn't cure. Sides, don't you think the skipper knows what's the matter with us? Afore the other chaps could reply, the skipper himself comes down, accompanied by the fust mate, with a look on his face which made Harry give the deepest and hollowest cough he'd ever done. What they really want, says the skipper, turning to the mate, is careful nussin. I wish you'd let me nussin says the fuss mate only ten minutes i put em both on their legs and run em for their lives into the bargain in ten minutes hold your tongue sir says the skipper what you say is unfeeling besides being an insult to me do you think i studied medicine all these years without knowing when a man's ill the fuss mate growled something and went on deck and the skipper started examining of em again he said they was wonderfully patient lying in bed so long, and he had em wrapped up in bedclothes and carried on deck, so as the pure air could have a go at em. We had to do the carrying, and there they sat, breathing the pure air, and looking at the fuss mate out of the corners of their eyes. If they wanted anything from below, 
one of us had to go and fetch it and by the time they was taken down to bed again we all resolved to be took ill too only two of em did it though for harry who was a powerful ugly-tempered chap swore he'd do all sorts of dreadful things to us if we didn't keep well and hearty and all except these two did one of em mike rafferty laid up with a swellin on his ribs which i knew myself he had at for fifteen years and the other chap had paralysis i never saw a man so really happy as the skipper was he was up and down with his medicines and his instruments all day long and used to make notes of the cases in a big pocket-book and read em to the second mate at meal-times the forecastle had been turned into hospital about a week and i was on deck doing some odd job or the other when the cook comes up to me pulling a face as long as a fiddle another invalid says he fust mate's gone stark starin mad mad says i yes says he he's got a big basin in the galley and he's laughin like a hyena and mixin bilge water and ink and paraffin and butter and soap and all sorts of things up together the smell's enough to kill a man i've had to come away curious like i just walked up to the galley and puts my ed in and there was the mate as the cook said smiling all over his face and ladling some thick sticky stuff into a stone bottle how's the poor sufferers sir says he stepping out of the galley just as the skipper was going by they're very bad but i hope for the best says the skipper looking at him hard i'm glad to see you're turned a bit more feeling yes sir says the mate i didn't think so at fuss but i can see now them chaps is all very ill you'll excuse me for saying it but i don't quite approve of your treatment i thought the skipper would a bust my treatment says he my treatment what do you know about it you're treating em wrong sir says the mate i have here patting the jar a remedy which would cure them all if you'd only let me try it pooh says the skipper one medicine cure all diseases the old story what is it where'd you get it from says he i brought the ingredients aboard with me says the mate it's a wonderful medicine discovered by my grandmother and if i might only try it i'd thoroughly cure them poor chaps rubbish says the skipper very well sir says the mate shrugging his shoulders of course if you won't let me you won't still i tell you if you'd let me try i'd cure em all in two days that's a fair challenge well they talked and talked and talked until at last the skipper give way and went down below with the mate and told the chaps they was to take the new medicine for two days just to prove the mate was wrong let poor old dan try it first says harry starting up and sniffing as the mate took the cork out he's been awful bad since you've been away harry's worse than i am sir says dan it's only his kind heart that makes him say that it don't matter which is fust says the mate filling a tablespoon with it there's plenty for all now harry take it says the skipper harry took it and the fuss he made you'd ha thought he was swallering a football it stuck all round his mouth and he carried on so dreadful that the other invalids was half sick afore it came to them by the time the other three had had theirs it was as good as a pantermine and the mate corked the bottle up and went and sat down on a locker while they tried to rinse their mouths out with the luxuries which had been given em how do you feel says the skipper i'm dying says dan so am i says harry i believe the mate's pisoned us the skipper looks over at the mate very stern and shakes his head slowly it's all right says the mate it's always like that the first dozen or so doses dozen or so doses says old dan in a faraway voice it has to be taken every twenty minutes says the mate pulling out his pipe and lighting it and the four men groaned all together 
i can't allow it says the skipper i can't allow it men's lives mustn't be sacrificed for an experiment tin experiment says the mate very indignant it's an old family medicine well they shan't have any more says the skipper firmly look here says the mate if i kill any one of these men i'll give you twenty pound honor bright i will make it twenty-five says the skipper considering very good says the mate twenty-five i can't say no fairer than that can i it's about time for another dose now he gave him another tablespoonful all round as the skipper left and the chaps what wasn't invalids nearly bust with joy he wouldn't let him have anything to take the taste out cause he said it didn't give the medicine a chance and he told us other chaps to remove the temptation and you bet we did after the fifth dose the invalids began to get desperate and when they heard they'd got to be woke up every twenty minutes through the night to take the stuff they sort of gave up old dan said he felt a gentle glow stealing over him and strengthening him and harry said that it felt like a healing balm to his lungs all of em agreed it was a wonderful sort of medicine and arter the sixth dose the man with paralysis dashed up on deck and ran up the rigging like a cat he sat there for hours spittin and swore he'd brain anybody who interrupted him and arter a little while mike rafferty went up and joined him and if the fuss mate's ears didn't burn by reason of the things them two poor sufferers said about him they ought to they was all doing full work next day and though of course the skipper saw how he'd been done he didn't allude to it not in words that is but when a man tries to make four chaps do the work of eight and hits em when they don't it's a easy job to see where the shoe pinches end of a change of treatment by w w jacobs